I am adding sexual reproduction to the simulation and it is like putting a multiplier on all cool phenomena. And if that's the case, you might wonder, you've been working on this game for years now, what took you so long? Well, because it's also an opportunity to do something much bigger, because it doesn't necessarily stop at two sexes that remain the same throughout an animal's lifetime. In this video, we will go over all stages and possible side paths, from asexual reproduction via animals with a larval stage, all the way to species with a separate worker and queen form. This is the scary and sexy update. For those of you new here, this is evolution simulation game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It has two game modes. There are scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements, but there's also a sandbox where you can build your own algae, plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. First of all, why is sexual reproduction even so common on Earth? Also, humans cannot reproduce without first exchanging genes. How can that be advantageous over just reproducing whenever you feel like it? Let's say we have a population of 100 animals that will give birth to a new generation next year, also of 100 animals, which will, the year after that, also produce 100 animals, etc. Which animals get to reproduce and how often is mostly decided at random. But it's also influenced by one trait, let's call it fitness. Fitness is a number between 0 and 100, and the closer to 100 it is, the more likely that an animal will be a parent to at least one of the children of the next generation. The average fitness number in the population, you guessed it, varies at random, but because animals with higher fitness are more likely to reproduce, it increases over time, like this. There's a large random component to this simulation, so it's different every time you run it. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it takes a little while and then catches up, sometimes it even goes down at the end. The only thing we can say for sure is that it goes up most of the time. Now imagine that each animal is not the child of one parent, but a mix of two. How does that change the fitness over time? In this run it goes up quickly and stays high. Let's do another one, and another one, and another one. As you can see, sexual reproduction is a much more reliable way to spread beneficial adaptations within a species. With asexual reproduction, the same thing might happen, but it also might not happen, you don't know. While with sexual reproduction, it always goes up and it's always fast. If you want to try this for yourself, I've published a Python script I've used for this on GitHub. The link is in the description below. Okay, so that's the theory, but how do we add this to the game? Well, what you maybe didn't realize is that sexual reproduction already is in the game, but only for plants. The system there allows only plants with the same pollination organ, for example flowers, to fertilize each other. The result is a blend of these two plants, and it works with any plant, no matter how different. I like the unique new plants that this generates, but it's not only unrealistic, it's also hard to extend to animals. I mean, how would it work? Would two animals need the same genitals to be able to mate? As a side note, after thinking about this long and hard, I've decided I'm not going to include genitals as a body part class. I do realize there's a significant group of more serious players that would do interesting experiments with that feature. But we all know what will happen if I add a penis body part to a game where everybody can place as many body parts wherever they want. Apparently the Spore developers even coined TTP as a technical term for this phenomenon, meaning time to penis. And let me tell you, the TTP for this game would be so short that it wouldn't be good for its reputation. Okay, so no genitals to decide who can mate with whom? Just mate with your own species then, as a more realistic solution. No, that wouldn't work either, because within a species there's barely any variation. This is because, in the sapling, every organism with different body parts is classified as a separate species to match playtester expectations. In the end, I've settled on something in between. If we draw a family tree of species, Organisms from this species can mate with the parent species and the grandparent species, but also with all species that branched off from it and the species that branched off from them. This way, if a species emerges that is somehow better adapted to survive somewhere, it will be able to mate with related species and spread its genes quickly. Next problem. How will the mating system itself work? For a long time I had all kinds of ideas floating around, like species that could reproduce both asexually and sexually, species that could fertilize each other's eggs, and after countless hours trying to design something simple and elegant, I suddenly had the insight that everything I wanted could be summarized into four toggles that can all be turned on and off individually. 
asexual reproduction, sexual reproduction, external fertilization and internal fertilization. The default so far was just asexual reproduction, but you can now also turn on sexual reproduction. And if you want to force mating, like in mammals, you can even turn off asexual reproduction. In a hermaphrodite species like this one, that does mean you should turn on internal fertilization. The other option of course is external fertilization, meaning that the animal first lays the eggs and that they are fertilized later by another individual. This won't be possible for eggs with a thicker shell though. To give the player some more options there, I've also added quite a few more egg types. An example of a land egg that can be fertilized looks like this. And since this is an update about horror, I've also added the ultimate scary alien egg from the movie Alien. Besides the fact that this one can be fertilized, you'll notice that it is firmly attached to the ground. This prevents it from being blown away in areas with high wind strength. In other words, wind resistance is another new statistic of eggs. An example of an egg that cannot handle high wind strength is this one, because it will simply roll away. If you need an egg that will actually stay in its nest, in return for less cold resistance, we now also have this one, inspired by dinosaur eggs. Aquatic eggs will use the underwater equivalent of wind strength, which is of course current speed. An example of an egg that can handle higher current speeds is this one, with hooks to attach to rocks and algae. It's inspired by the eggs of skates and sharks. Okay, so we've discussed all options animals have when it comes to reproducing and sharing genes. But I totally didn't mention that other innovation that often goes together with sexual reproduction. You see, with the system I have described so far, mating does not happen that often. Because it requires two animals meet that are sexually mature, not already pregnant and have collected enough energy to give birth. It would be much more efficient if part of the population was always ready to mate and can focus on spreading genes. In other words, we need an evolutionary innovation called males. But you might have noticed a pattern in my game design choices by now. It will be up to the player to create up to six sexes and define what each sex is. As an example, let's make the system how it works in humans. Sex A can do sexual reproduction and sex B does not give birth, but can spread genes internally. You also get to decide how likely each sex is for newborn animals by changing the letters on each of these eggs. And if you have more than one sex that can give birth, you can even change this for each sex individually. Or alternatively, you can make it so it depends on temperature, just like in turtles and crocodilians. Or perhaps you want to have it more dynamic and have animals change sex when needed. You could for example have a hormone that slowly fills up during an animal's lifetime and changes sex when it is full, but resets the hormone each time the animal sees a potential mate. With all of these options, players quickly lose track on what sex an animal is, so there will be two ways to keep sexes apart. The first one is simple. I'm now showing this information on mouse over, along with the species name. Playtesting shows that the first thing players really want to know is what an animal eats, so I've added the food icons as well. But of course, a much cooler way to keep sexes apart is by introducing sexual dimorphism. You can give different sexes different mating behavior, as we've just shown, but there's nothing stopping you from giving sexes other colors, other sizes, other body parts, anything really, as long as you keep the basic torso the same. Under the hood this was quite a pain to get right. I initially just wanted to take the easy approach and store a separate set of genes, so to say, for each sex. So in a species with three sexes, even though an individual is sex B, for example, it also carries all the info needed for sex A and sex C, which can in theory be completely different animals. This doesn't work however, because it means each evolutionary innovation has to be discovered by each sex individually. So if sex A evolves a better mouth, this would only be useful to sex A and would not affect the other sexes in any way. So now instead, the first sex is used as the basis, and each additional sex is stored as a list of changes. And while this was already quite a pain to implement, the real headache started when I realized the new system would need to interact with every single little caching mechanism in the game. As you can imagine, the sapling has optimization mechanisms all over the place to prevent frame rates in the single digits. To give you the simplest example, each time the game has to translate the genetic code for an organism into a 3D model, it stores the model in a cache, so that the next time this organism needs to be built, it can just be cloned from the cache, instead of being rebuilt from scratch. 
Now with the addition of sexes, each genetic code can have up to 6 appearances. If I would continue using this system as is, all sexes would look like the first 3D model the game decides to build, so this whole system needs a rework. In the new situation, all caching mechanisms need to identify a model not only by genetic definition, but also by sex. So in turn, every time an existing model is taken out, or a new model is put in, the code needs to somehow be able to provide this sex, and this happens at hundreds of places. So with that plumbing out of the way, what are some more fun things that we could do with this system? Well, the game already has separate forms for young and old animals. Why not use this same system to store a separate juvenile form? As you can see, I've designed the icons to really make clear what kind of things I hope the players will do with this. It's a system that in real life is mostly used by insects with their larval stage, where the larva fills a completely different niche, allowing one animal to fill two niches during its lifetime. So maybe a flying nectar-eating adult, but a crawling leaf-eating larva. Or a land-dwelling adult, but an aquatic larva. You may remember from the previous season that you can actually see the young hanging from the adult if you give it hands, which can give quite funny results now. The default young animal will actually look exactly like its parent, but smaller. Except for the eyes. This is one of the many tricks I've picked up from analyzing every little detail in Spore, if you make the eyes bigger, it will look cuter. Works every time. So, in short, along with sexual reproduction, I'm adding the option for animal species to have different forms. To my own surprise though, the longer I played with this system, the more cool mechanisms I could come up with. Firstly, if you are on a map with seasons, you can have a separate form adapted for the cold, with more body fat and fur, and then use the instinct, if you feel too cold, change sex, to activate it. And if the cold season has snow, you could even take advantage of the new camouflage system and make this winter version of your species white. Second idea, you could have an alternation of generations kind of effect where sex A always gives birth to sex B and vice versa, again to make sure that two individuals of the same species fill different niches. On Earth we see this strategy mostly in plants, but on your planet it's of course up to you. Ok, no, this is cool, let's do one more. You could create non-reproducing sexes with distinct roles, like workers and soldiers, like you see in bees, wasps and ants. Body size is also influenced by sex, so you could have a relatively rare but very large reproducing animal, and then lots of smaller helpers. But my favorite idea, and I will really stop after this one, is inspired by some grasshopper species, which have two separate forms. One normal solitary form, and one swarming form, which looks and behaves differently. Apparently, when these grasshoppers, called locusts, encounter other locusts, it releases some sort of hormone, and if this happens enough times per minute during a 4 hour period, they transform into this swarm form. Locusts in swarm form are really attracted to each other, and made much quicker, forming, as the name suggests, swarms. So we could, for example, have a hormone that counts the number of encounters with animals of the same species. And above a certain threshold, have the animal changed to another niche, or from an asexual to a sexual form. I guess I could go on for hours, which is effectively the answer to the question we started with. Why did it take so long for sexual reproduction to be added? Well, this is a topic that I really needed to nerd out on. And I have to admit, I kind of lost sight on whether actual players will also like this. So I guess all I can do now is wait and see whether sex sells is also true for a video game about evolution. Today's first bonus body parts are shark fins, which I originally really did not want to add. This is because there already is a really similar body part evolving from land fins inspired by dolphins. Shark fins and dolphin fins are really similar, which is convergent evolution, a beautiful phenomenon, but gameplay wise it's a bit weird to have two near identical parts. What made me change my mind is the fact that the shark fins are in a really different place in the family tree, and in a place that could use some more scary material. I did my best to make them look as different as possible, but if you look at them side by side, the difference is smaller than I'd hoped for. The second one is this one, and it is mainly here to fix a stupid mistake I made. As you know, in the previous update I've added both arthropod mouths and filter feeding, so back then I was looking for something arthropod-like that could filter feed. 
and then I learned about the extinct family of the radiodons, so I looked no further and added this mouth. Several paleontologists, however, were friendly enough to point out that this particular mouth, inspired by Petoya, was actually not a filter feeder, but a predator. So let's try again, I think this one really is a filter feeder. Okay, bye.